So I um, wanted to just talk to you a little bit about your book today and, um, you know, be able to share it with kind of the addiction crowd because that is a, uh, everything that you spoke about was really so, it's what we talk about here every day. And so if you could talk about the sort of the evolution of your work, you know, you talked about kind of the gut brain connection. How, how did this all progress to this moment? Well, the, uh, this book is a manifestation of a conversation I had two years ago in this room where I'm sitting right now. And it was a conversation between me and our son, Austin, who had just finished his internal medicine residency. And I said, you know, what was the most frustrating thing about it? And he, his response was, you know, we did everything we could to learn as much information and we did everything we could to transmit that information. But, you know, it, it failed after that in terms of patients taking the information and acting upon it. And it turns out that then we began to study that, that between 50 to 80% of the recommendations we make higher in your field, uh, people don't follow through on. And we would point fingers saying, you don't have the willpower, what's wrong with you? And the patients would point fingers at themselves. I know this is important. Why can't I stop eating the way I'm eating? And we, we thought it was really important to sort of deconstruct the decision-making process and realize that there are some absolute uh, physiological brain substrates for how we make our decisions, be it coming from a, an impulsive part of the brain, the amygdala, which is you know, really going to just make short-term based decisions based upon what I want right now, which obviously plays a big role in addiction, versus being able to rein in that impulsivity and bring the prefrontal cortex to bear such that our decisions are more forward uh, focused, uh, more involved in looking at consequences, both positive and negative towards the decisions. Uh, I mean, as they relate to the decisions that we make right now. And that led us to understanding this delineation then between these two areas, amygdala versus prefrontal cortex. As we explored that uh, delineation further, we recognize that there's more than just decision-making involved here that it is really intimately related to uh, things like empathy and compassion and cognitive empathy and good versus bad. And uh, had a very, uh, a much broader net being thrown than, than we had considered. And that forms you know, the basis for this book. We realized that um, you know, what's crippling us globally in terms of health are these chronic degenerative slash inflammatory slash lifestyle related diseases, whether it's coronary artery disease being number one, followed closely by things like cancer and Alzheimer's and diabetes, that these are to a significant degree inflammatory disorders and as such related to the choices that we make. But when we got our arms around the fact that inflammation as a process threatens our decision-making ability and that we then make further bad decisions that further increases inflammation, that is a feed forward cycle that is quite characteristic of uh, dependence or addiction. Yeah. You can't get out of that loop. Yeah, and I think um, when we were speaking last time, you also brought in the whole depression anxiety into that, into that group of, of inflammatory responses that, um, you know, as I understood it and still understand it, that um, inflammation is a precursor to depression and anxiety. And the only reason why I'm bringing that up is because of the high incidence of these things nationally. And also in the addiction world, um, there's very few people now that just have an addiction issue that don't have anxiety, depression, some sort of PTSD combined with that. So I, I wonder if that's Yes. Yeah, I mean, you have to ask, why is it we're seeing such an upsurge in the number of patients or individuals diagnosed with these issues? And I think that it's obviously not a genetic thing, as my good friend, Dr. Daniel Amen, uh, talks about, that genes load the gun, but environment pulls the trigger. So, you know, if this were a genetic issue, then our incidence and prevalence would, well, the incidence, anyhow, uh, would be uh, pretty static. So we know that uh, environmental issues, including diet and other lifestyle choices are absolutely instrumental here. And 
responsible because those are the variables. Genetics is really not a variable, while epigenetics is a variable, but epigenetics then relates back to our choices. So, um, so that said, uh, you know, we realize that we are then involved in these statistics and that our choices are extremely valuable. Dan has a new book coming out Tuesday of next week. Here it is, The End of Mental Illness. So I would, if I were you, I'd pick that up. I just uh, interviewed him several hours ago about this and we'll put that out on our uh, feed before the book comes out. But, um, you know, it's very empowering. Uh, it's, uh, it's a responsibility too on the part of uh, patients that they realize, or even healthy people for that matter, uh, who want to reduce their risk, especially if there's a family history, that there's a lot to, oh, sorry. There's a lot to do on the front end that can absolutely relate to reducing risk. So what do we talk about? Prevention as a strategy for mental illness, who knew? Yeah, and, and so getting back to this kind of feed forward loop, so I make bad choices, that increases my inflammation, which then increases my propensity to make more bad choices, and then people get more frustrated. It's we uh, kind of in the addiction mental health world, this is this ongoing thing. And, and I, I remember reading in the book, you were like, we make all these great suggestions. Why don't people follow them? And I think that we all um, would agree if you asked just anybody on the street, hey, do you think if you ate a little bit better and slept a little bit better and, and meditated for a couple of minutes every day that your life would be better? And of course, people would say, yeah. And but what, the, here's the care. We're offering them better decision-making ability. Everybody knows they're making bad decisions. And that's what has never been vetted before. We never, you know, it's never been brought out. It's kind of like the secret sauce that we identified. Uh, it's the same inflammation threatening decision-making that threatens our risk for coronary artery disease, cancer and diabetes and Alzheimer's and autism and Parkinson's. So uh, threatens the decision-making kind of ratchets it to the top of the apex in terms of then the trickle down risk for all the other things. So if we can target decision making, then we get a 50 to 80% like increased likelihood that we're gonna be more effective in terms of our outreach with information. So we've just been hired to do a program with a, uh, a collaborator at Harvard on a physician wellness program um, that will say for physician wellness, look, your first time what we're going to talk about is not uh, you know, uh, the meditation part, all the other you know, stress reduction issues. Week one, we're gonna say, let's talk about how well you sleep, or why don't we get you to buy a potted plant and put it in your living room? It seems very random, but you know, the, the science that underlies how sleep is powerfully anti-inflammatory and the anti-inflammatory anti effect of being exposed to nature, even a plant or even a photograph of nature is powerful. So we're trying just to augment our likelihood of being in a better place for our further recommendations than to stick down the line. And that relates to patient care as well. Look, Mrs. Jones has diabetes. First office visit, first week, we don't even talk about diet. And surprise to her, no. You know what, you're diabetic. Today we're gonna to talk about improving your ability moving forward to stick with the next set of recommendations. So this week, all we're gonna talk about is looking at your sleep hygiene and ask you to, uh, to buy a potted plant or to walk around the block. Next week, we'll start to talk about a more ketogenic diet, et cetera. So if you could, um talk about a little bit about this mechanism. You mentioned the kind of the prefrontal cortex, or the, this is kind of our, uh, if we want to say our higher self or our access to the greater good. Right. The um, adult in the room. You know, yeah, I, you know, the person I want to be. And then this amygdala, which is our reactive self, um, you know, that self, the quick temper, the defensiveness, the, the propensity to grab something to feel good. Um, if you could, Talk a little bit about that connection and how it gets hijacked, uh, just so people can begin to understand uh, what it, what you're referring to in in your. New well, book. the hijacking is ab, uh, you know, it's a very strong term, but uh, we're good with it. I mean, we know that, for example, 
uh, you know, the addition of sweeteners to 68% of the 1.2 million foods sold in America is a, an obvious effort, an act of commission uh, to hijack our, into our brains and to cause us to be more impulsive and be more impulsive as it relates to moving forward with respect to our food choices. Uh, that, hi that hijacks into a very primitive desire that we have for sweet, which was a powerful survival mechanism that allowed us to make body fat and uh, be prepared for times of caloric restriction or caloric uh, scarcity. In other words, eating the desire for sweet, uh, there are very few animals that like sweet, but we like sweet uh, because it tells us fruit is ripe. We eat sweet, we, uh, we secrete insulin, we make body fat, we survive we get fat. That's not serving us today, but it's serving the interests of those people who are putting uh, those sweeteners in foods. So uh, that said, uh, it's an obvious effort to hack into our brains. Our brains are hacked into by you know, our digital experiences that create a sense that we're not good enough and provide the quick fix for that, that are constantly bombarding us with clickbait that take us away from whatever it is we're online trying to do. And it's not to serve us. You know, uh, Kristen Lang said that in 1921, that technology is a useful servant, but a dangerous master. And we've got to contextualize our digital experiences in terms of what they're doing for or against our brain wiring. So in a very real sense, the term hijacked is, is uh, very appropriate because there are, not to sound like it's a conspiracy theory, but it's obvious that there is great value to others in terms of where we dedicate ourselves while we're experiencing our digital world. I have uh, direct experience. You know, I um, occasionally I'll go down and spend a, a silent retreat in the jungle, so there's no Wi-Fi there. And I notice in my first couple of days that I'm more uh, tense. I, you know, I'm, I'm grabbing for my tech. I'm grabbing for the phone. Uh, you know, I'm so important, you know, what's in my email that wasn't there 10 minutes ago, all of these things. And one of the things that I've been sort of studying is how people, if you look at news and you look at the internet, uh, people are paid to get our attention. You know, the more no question. that somebody can have your attention, hey, the more likely you are to buy things or, or whatever. So there's a real financial incentive for people to be sucked in, you called it clickbait, and I think that's such a great term, and I've succumbed to that many a time, and uh, and I know other people that'll listen to this will as well, and so all of a sudden, you know, uh, it's I sit down for a five-minute search on something, and two hours go by, and I'm still sitting in front of this computer, and you know what happened, and then I want to sit there more, so it becomes an addiction itself. No question. In fact, you know there is a term called internet addiction, affecting 6% of the global population. That's five times the, uh, the population of Great Britain. And it's characterized by observable MRI proven changes in uh, brain connectivity, in severing that connection between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. Um, and it is by any definition of addiction, uh, you know, satisfies those criteria. So, uh, it's a very real problem. I'm not saying that we're going to be Luddites or should be Luddites. Uh, you know, we write our books with the assistance of unlimited access to information via the internet. But it's the unconscious issues that are occurring uh, that are powerfully threatening to our brains, our happiness, our sense of contentedness, um, all as a consequence of what we do, or to some degree, uh, a consequence of what we do online. It's, it's interesting because it, when you hear about online in the communities, these social media communities that are supposedly bringing us together, and I, ha I know in my own life, hey, there's some people that I knew in high school that somehow we got reconnected. Hey, how you Go doing? Go for it. It's wonderful. It's, but it's a, we apply what's called the test of time. T, how much time are you going to dedicate? You mentioned five minutes turns into two hours. What is the task and how much time will you allot for that? Be strict about that. I, is it intentional? What is your goal? To connect with some guy from high school or to research uh, the kynurenic acid pathways that relates to serotonin? Whatever, you've got your goal. M, do you remain mindful while you're online? Are you aware of your goal uh, or are you distracted, taken out of your state 
uh, by clickbait and other things that pop up. And finally, E, is it an enriching, positive experience? The test of time. Yeah, uh, and I, I read that in your book. And I think the part that is, is challenging for us, and you know, we've been talking about this for, for the last 16 years, you know, and um, the correlation when people come in and they have a, a de- let's say they're in a seriously depressed or they have PTSD or they're in some kind of an addiction, either pharmaceutical or street drugs. Uh, and then we begin to tell them, by the way, you know, food is important. That's a hard enough sell as it is. And then now we say, well, by the way, your attention and the, and the brain is not meant to have all these quick uh, fixes, you know, one minute videos and one second of this and these, um, to how do we help people to correlate, wow, how I spend my internet time and all these other things are actually either contributing to my primary condition, which is addiction or depression, um, and have them really grab hold of that. You know, I think you alluded to it before, hey, look, we got to take it in sort of baby steps. Um, but that's, the, that's a part that we seem to be having a hard time with, letting people know, by the way, your cell phone is addictive and you'll have a better chance of, of success if you don't use it. But people can't seem to make that connection. I agree, but I think that you know what our mission was in this new book in Brainwash was to call it out and call out the peer reviewed science, the gold standard, the, the, the playing field that we've used you know, throughout our books for years It's not that Dr. Perlmutter thinks this or that, but I'm saying, and Austin, our co-author, what does the research show? What does the research demonstrate about, um, you know, actual brain morphological changes that are taking place as a consequence of internet usage? And this is information people need to know. And to be to be clear, uh, as you've seen, I mean, there's it's all about the peer-reviewed science. It's all about what this is telling us. And then, moreover, what do we do about it? Then what are the actionable points that allow us then to repair the damage? And we know through this gift that we have of neuroplasticity that we can rewire. We can redirect the connections in the brain, reestablish a better relationship between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex, and bring the adult back into the room to make better decisions in a loving way. Well, we have, it's interesting because I have, um, we've thought about addiction uh, as, a, as a habit. And, and in my own experience, I know, you know, I came from a very strong addiction background. I went through the traditional avenues to, to recover. And in that paradigm, and it's, it's somewhat shifting, but it's still, this is a, an incurable brain disease they used to call it a reward mechanism uh, mishap up there that somehow your brain just can't be rewarded enough. And this is going to be a permanent condition. And um, in the past, you know, that wasn't my case. I, I don't even think about my addiction anymore. And I know plenty of people that have gone through a process that feel the same way. Well, that's true. I mean, again, the brain has the ability to remold itself. I mean, it, it, receptors have the ability, the ability to recalibrate and not uh, you know, and increase their sensitivity so that there doesn't have to be as much of a stimulus moving forward. Uh, that's that's classic. That's how that's how we deal with uh, insulin sensitivity, for example. We can reestablish sensitivity of the insulin receptor by changing the diet such that insulin levels come down and that receptor regains its ability to be sensitive towards insulin. That happens with the dopamine receptor as well. The less it's bombarded, the more sensitive it becomes, the less you will need to stimulate it. So, you know, this is kind of basic neuropharmacology uh, that we're trying to take advantage of. But more importantly, getting back to our our model of rewiring and reconnecting to the prefrontal cortex allows us then to make those decisions such that there is less of a bombardment of these reward circuits day in and day out. Yeah, and so let's let's talk about how how we do that. Some basic pointers, um, you know, for us, we hold people in a container, right? So we have them, and um, and we're doing. It's interesting. You you came up with your points on on how to accomplish that, 
And it's interesting, those are all the points. And somehow some people will take that and carry that on and then some people won't. So when we talk, we talk about um, you know, the bombardment of, of uh, dopamine and, and these things, how do we sort of ring this thing back in and get, get some hope and some control back in our lives and bring the adult back in the room as you Yeah, I mean, again, it's like uh, anything to do with addiction and that is getting your foot in the door. And uh, your foot in the door might be through an aggressive approach at something seemingly unrelated like sleep uh, or exercise or dietary change or meditation um, or a gratitude journal. However, you can augment decision-making the tiniest bit will then foster the ability to bring the next player onto the team and even continue to augment the decision-making uh, uh, possibilities. So, you know, it's not about bringing the entire program on board day one, who's gonna do that? We know darn well that's not gonna work. You can't load people up like that. But I think you have to look at what are the lever, what's the lever for an individual person? Where might his or her biggest uh, failure be uh, in terms of those lifestyle choices that are really affecting decision-making? It might be that people just cannot make the dietary change. That's not going to happen today or this week. Maybe for them, it is nature. Maybe for them, it's sleep. But I think when we present why we're doing this in the context of giving you a better ability to make good choices, then people feel empowered. Might there be some placebo effect involved here? Hopefully, there will be. I, I don't care whether it's placebo or not. But what we see is people, you know, they, they improve their ability to, to get their arms around things, uh, whether it's placebo or not. And that, to me, it, you know, we're looking at the result here. It doesn't matter. Understand. So the, if we talk about, um, again, I think it might be helpful for these people to understand the pathway. You know, this amygdala and its function and the prefrontal cortex and in function and how is it connected and how does this thing uh, become disconnected? You know, how, what, are the, what are these two structures? Because I Well, was, you know, there are a variety um, of things that threaten the, the connection. Um, anything that amplifies amygdala activity tends to strengthen our connection directly to the amygdala. These are, you know, mostly stress-related uh, issues. We do know that even one night of non-restorative sleep uh, will light up the amygdala when confronted by a fearful picture even uh, by 60%. The more, we can, uh, the more we activate the amygdala, the more we're connected to it. You know, neurons that uh, fire together will ultimately wire together. But as it relates to the connection part, I think one of the biggest factors that leads to, that threatens that connection is, is inflammation. So inflammation in the form of uh, our sleep considerations, food considerations, lack of nature, um, you know, and on the upside, better night's sleep, better food, meditation, nature exposure, gratitude, all associated with decreasing inflammation and reestablishing this connection. You know, I gave a talk this past week in uh, a conference in New York, and you know, there were I used about 160 slides, but one slide stands out in my mind. And it's a, a, a images of brain connectivity. We're able to image that now using a, a kind of unique form of functional MRI. And I'll show that when I come to visit. Uh, it shows brain connectivity based or plotted against uh, C-reactive protein, a marker of inflammation. With a CRP less than one, incredible brain reactivity. With a CRP, a marker of inflammation greater than three, dramatic to reduction in connectivity. So inflammation is kind of front and center here. Uh, and when we set ourselves up for disconnection syndrome, being disconnected between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala, then the amygdala goes uh, more unchecked. We have what is called top-down control of the amygdala, whereby the prefrontal cortex exerts this top-down control, reining in the impulsivity of the amygdala, reining in the uh, emo, uh, socially unacceptable behavior of the amygdala, 
and allowing us to behave in a socially acceptable way and make good decisions. But when we are disconnected, when disconnection syndrome fo is fostered, then we are less able to rein in our socially acceptable or unacceptable behaviors, as it were, and we're more likely to be impulsive in our decision making. So anything that threatens inflammation is going to threaten those abilities. So we have to live a life that is less inflammatory, which has been you know, the, the central theme in so much of the literature that's put out in the past decade as it relates to our biggest diseases of our times. But now as it relates to our wiring of our brain, it really takes on even greater importance, I believe. So uh, but these big diseases of our time, um, what I, I read and, and what I heard you say earlier, that many of these are lifestyle related, if we look at Oh, very much so. That's right. So lifestyle related. So if we can relate that back to addiction and depression and, and anxiety, then what I also hear is that those things are lifestyle related. There's some connection to a lifestyle. Um, without question. Without question. And I, I'll tell you, again, I don't mean to, to harp on this book, The End of Mental Illness, but here's the subtitle. How Neuroscience is Transforming Psychiatry and Helping Prevent, who knew, or reverse mood, anxiety disorders, ADHD, addictions, PTSD, psychosis, personality disorders, and more. And it's all about lifestyle. It's all about making decisions day to day. So the um, burden is to some degree shifted back towards the client or patient or an individual who is not yet a client or patient in a preventive strategy to make better decisions. And so, you know, there's a lot of alignment moving forward amongst uh, this cadre of neuroscientists uh, towards the same uh, ends here, you know, recognizing these fundamental mechanisms of inflammation, threatening our brain wiring, threatening our neurochemistry, uh, as it relates, for example, to serotonin availability through the kynurenic acid pathway, et cetera. And, and really understanding that if, inflammation is what we say it is, then our lifestyles that do in fact matter a whole heck of a lot. Yeah, and I, if you could just speak a little bit, you know, we get um, a lot of people with just post-traumatic stress disorder, right? So they have had something in the past. Uh, they otherwise have pretty clean lifestyles, right? And how then, if you look at uh, cortisol and those things, create this inflammatory response and and that, I think, is an important link for people to make uh, to, to kind of support this inflammation story. Can you speak to that a little bit? Well, of course. So, you know, this PTSD, which is far more pervasive than we want to give it credit for, uh, you know, involving lots of children uh, and certainly, you know, the more classic PTSDs of people with a traumatic uh, experience, you know, soldiers, et cetera, uh, is, as you mentioned, uh, predicated to some degree on a cortisol surge during the event. And we know that cortisol is directly involved in severing this connection. Uh, we know that um, you know, any powerfully emotional event uh, tends to cause these recurrent circuits that tend to activate uh, the amygdala. And we know that there are lots of day-to-day um, -day experiences that will uh, reactivate the unconscious memory that were memories uh, that were embedded, uh, those engrams by the original traumatic event or events, causing anxiety to be manifesting even in a situation that is not threatening because it is uh, augmenting the uh, influence of those original uh, uh, fearful or uh, threatening events from earlier in life. So, you know, again, we can uh, reprogram that information. We can allow a more balanced response uh, to allow the uh, um, amygdala to calm down and to allow the prefrontal cortex to let the, the amygdala know that we don't need to be active right now, that while this may seem like a threatening event, when uh, an engram is, is activated by a current event that isn't necessarily threatening. So we can bring that uh, ability back to the brain that is so darn threatened, you know, PTSD, uh, anxiety disorders 
are characterized by increased amygdalar activity. And that then is, uh, so, it, so what I understand is then the cortisol that then is causing this inflammation in the body and feed that you mentioned a feed forward system, sort of the worse it gets, the worse it gets. Is that what you mean by Without that? question. I mean, um, uh, you know, we know that cortisol at low levels is actually very important for encoding memory, but at high levels or chronically sustained levels, even if they are not that high, is profoundly detrimental to specifically uh, the cells within the hippocampus, uh, specifically uh, in the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus are powerfully threatened by cortisol. Beyond that, we know that cortisol is ex extremely threatening to the diversity and uh, array of organisms that live within the gut and is associated then with increased gut permeability that fans the flames of, you guessed it, inflammation. So everything, everything ultimately ties together. I mean, uh, it becomes, uh, you know, ultimately a pretty concise package now with a lot of these interesting puzzle pieces falling into place, not falling into place, being put into place by research. And, um, you know, everything begins to make a little bit more sense these days. So that, that tends to, if we look at all of this from a functional medicine standpoint, or a, you know, a holistic, we're a holistic being, so everything is affecting everything else in the body. Um, this should give people some some kind of hope to look at this thing from a more holistic level. I think, Dean, we we don't have all the answers, right? Uh, but I think that we offer up, you know, another leg to the stool here that uh, we've uncovered. I think some pretty deep and profound information. I would say that um, there is still a role for medication for some individuals with mental illness, no question, especially as it relates to the psychoses, without question. Uh, but you know, we bring other tools to the toolkit here. And beyond that, um, you know, certainly beyond mental illness, we're looking at happiness and contentment. What is contentment? Contentment means I finally have enough. I don't need to buy anything more online to make me happy. I don't need to continue consuming this or that sweet product, uh, alcohol product, whatever it may be, I don't need that anymore, I am content. Is it easy, is it simple? Not at all. Believe me, uh, you know better than most that it's a very, very complex multifactorial uh, problem we're dealing with here. But uh, if we can help move the needle one or two percentage points, why uh, it makes a, a good day's work. Agreed. And uh, well, I think, you know, I'll, I'll just hold up this again, because this, this, as I read it, I'm like, my goodness, this is, this is our treatment model. And, <laughs> and, um, and it spoke so, so concisely about sort of the, addiction of our culture, you know, and our disconnect. You, I, I love the term disconnection syndrome. Yeah, you're so right. People think about um, depression and anxiety, all these things that cause pain. Hey, what does that do? That keeps us inward and it keeps us separate. All the things that are- You know, that loneliness that is so fostered by this model and further fostered by this thing called social media, with all due respect, uh, is associated with significant risk for terrible medical problems. So uh, let me do this. Let me leave you with that thought because I've got to move on to another interview as fate would have it. But um, let's work out the, you know, the, the ability that we have to connect personally, which is really important uh, as we move forward over the next uh, several months. Okay, Dr. Perlmutter. Well, I look forward to your visit in November and we'll stay in touch. And again, thank you so much for your time and for all your help that you're giving us and so many. Thank you, Dean. All my best. All right. Same to you. Bye now. Bye-bye.